All right, uh, let's uh, switch gears a little bit uh, to uh, from uh, kind of like a community flavor conversation to the uh, industry uh, flavor. Uh, joining us next is uh, Dan Koshi, uh, Executive Director of uh, Automotive Great Linux and the General Manager of Automotive, uh, Automotive at Linux Foundation. Dan joins us today to share uh, on the state of the AGL Alliance moving forward. Please welcome Dan Koshi. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's see if this clicker works. <laughs> Perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan Koshi. I'm the executive director of Automotive Grade Linux, as uh, Nori just said. And I'm here to share today the really cool stuff that's going on in automotive and specifically in AGL. So raise your hand. Please be honest. How many people do this? So I'm estimating at least 50%, and I think some people are not being honest. <laughs> um, okay, so why, why? Why do we do this? It's because, let's be frank, the software in the vehicle has not kept up with the software in the mobile phone and the experience that consumers expect, right? And so it's so much easier to just put the phone there and use Google Maps or whatever and it's really sad because the car has a larger battery, it has a larger screen, it has better speakers. <laughs> you know, it's a great platform to do this kind of thing. And so we really need to bring the software uh, on par with the rest of the industry, such as mobile phones. And why, uh, you know, why and how did we get there? It's because the automotive industry traditionally has been quite fragmented. Um, you've had, even within a single car company, three, four, maybe five different operating systems. Anything from proprietary RTOS that were built in-house to QNX to even, for a while, Microsoft, which is still out there in some cars. And then also Linux came along, and Linux was great, but also it was Linux of, you know, different flavors of Linux. Uh, from, you know, vendor A, vendor B, vendor C, all with their own versions of kernels and they're all, you know, there was no consolidation of software. And this is why AGL was created, is to try to alleviate this challenge and this fragmentation. And the goal of AGL has always been to build a single software platform for the whole industry, but not to be directly downloadable to the car. Okay, sometimes people are mistaken, oh, I'm gonna get involved with AGL, I'm gonna change my car, I'm gonna download it to the car. That's not actually the goal of AGL. The goal of AGL is to produce 70 to 80% of a starting point for production projects. And the other 20, 30%, the car manufacturer, along with their you know, tier one and tier two suppliers, they complete the system, right? They add their favorite speech recognition provider. They add their favorite navigation provider. They add their favorite apps like Spotify and you know, different music apps, et cetera. And that's really the goal of AGL, is to provide that starting point where the kernel and the device drivers for a given piece of hardware is all common to everyone. The middleware for Bluetooth, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, radio, telephony, all these things are common to everyone. And then the APIs for things like navigation and speech recognition, et cetera, are common to everyone. These are not differentiating bits. They're not what people make money on in the automotive industry. And so by having the starting point and providing a common interface for everyone, it really, hopefully, will bring the car into uh, the modern territory of software. And that's really why AGL exists. We've been addressing every uh, function in the cockpit. Infotainment was the first version we released back in 2016. But since then, we've added instrument cluster, heads-up display, telematics, and we are also working on functional safety and ADAS features. In fact, some companies are already using AGL for ADAS, which will result in AGL someday being functionally, functional safety certified. We have 10 manufacturers supporting the project. Uh, most of the big ones here in Japan, Honda, Mazda, Mitsubishi Motors, Toyota, Suzuki. Uh, we have Mercedes-Benz and Volkswagen in uh, Germany supporting the project. We have SAIC in China, and we have one confidential one that we're not allowed to mention. And we have Hyundai in South Korea. So how is AGL doing? Um, well, you hear a lot about Android because 
they have a lot of money, <laughs> and, uh, but we're doing quite well, actually. Uh, this report was generated by a company called IHS Market. And uh, you can see the gray line up there is actually Android, but with no Google support. It's mostly used in China, where Google is not allowed to offer Google services. So people, they take Android, they fork it, and then they're on their own. They don't get updates, they don't get Google Maps, they don't get Google services. So for me, it's not really like a supported OS. So out of the supported OSs, uh, AGL is the market leader today. As you can see, we uh, significantly uh, have a bigger market share than uh, Android. And the reason Linux is going down is because in the early days before AGL existed, a lot of companies started with their own Linux base. And over time, they've migrated to AGL because obviously AGL is automotive specific and we provide uh, a whole stack. And so those companies are moving to AGL, which is why you're seeing the downtrend. Uh, and just two weeks ago, yet another uh, publication came out, which I was really happy to see. SNP uh, Global uh, said that Android will grow from 1% to 18%. That's not unexpected. Uh, but that AGL will grow from 14% to 23% by 2027. So we were really uh, happy to see this uh, and that we're, we're hanging on quite nicely uh, versus Android, which is our friend and our competition. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, let's uh, switch gears and talk about software. So when we first decided to do this automotive-based uh, distribution uh, and the full stack, uh, we decided to name it Unified Codebase. And the reason we named it Unified Codebase is precisely to send a message to the industry that we're, we want to try to eliminate this fragmentation and try to consolidate everyone on one platform. And uh, it's been quite a big success, actually, as you can see by the, mar you know, the market share data. And in case you don't know, uh, uh, this was my uh, colleague Walt Miner's idea. We name our releases after fish. Uh, <laughs> and Agile Albacore was the first one, all the way down Magic Marlin. Um, but the real reason I'm showing you this chart is that we do two releases a year, every year. And it, we kind of follow a TikTok model because uh, kind of like what Intel uh, TikTok model where the middle of the year release tends to be uh, about bug fixing and hardening and the first release of the year tends to be feature rich and new features because we show that release at CES in Las Vegas so it tends to have more uh, stuff to show but maybe more bugs. <laughs> um, our latest release is Prickly Pike. Um, you can uh, find all the release notes online. But a few highlights is we've updated uh, to the latest Yocto Kirkstone. Uh, we've done a lot of work on Flutter virtualization and Vert IO, which I'm going to talk about in a few slides here. We've added a Kuxa Val vehicles uh, signaling specification support. And we've done a lot of work on, work on instrument cluster as well. So let's switch gears and talk about what's coming up in the future. So you may have seen a lot of announcements from companies like Volkswagen, Mercedes, Toyota, et cetera, that they're building their own OS. And you know, as, as an engineer, and most many of you here are engineers and, and technical people, they're not actually building their own OS, OK? It's, it's really marketing people that I think don't know how to use the term. <laughs> um, what they're really doing is building a service delivery platform. And in, in almost all cases, they're using Linux and or AGL and or components thereof. And so really, let's not mistake that it's really AGL-based or Linux-based or combinations of. And other industry trends is that <clears throat> we're getting very, very powerful SOCs now. Multi-core SOCs, big cores, little cores, lots of cores. And Unfortunately, the software is also getting way more complex, more difficult to manage. AGL itself is over, over 100 million lines of code. Um, and that's just infotainment. <laughs> so imagine all the other functions in the vehicle, which I will talk about in a minute. And then the lines are blurring between embedded automotive type software and IT and cloud related services, which is really, back to the point I was making, what these car companies are trying to build. They're trying to build a service delivery platform for the consumer in the car to be able to have a, a much better experience. And 
so those lines are blurring. A lot of these car companies are partnering with cloud providers, et cetera, to provide those types of services. So what is AGL doing about all of this? Well, we already had a virtualization expert group. That group's been active for a long time, uh, mostly led by Panasonic, which has done great work for us. And we also had a container expert group. And both these expert groups, they were working on very similar things, especially when it comes to this service delivery stuff. And so we recently, uh, several months ago, um, uh, announced that we formed a new uh, expert group called Software Defined Vehicles. And SDV is led by Panasonic with participation from Volkswagen, AWS, Arm, and in fact, this is an old slide, there's a lot, a lot more companies participating now. And uh, the SDV expert group meets every other Tuesday and it's very heated discussions, large attendance. It's by far the hottest expert group we've ever had inside uh, AGL. So if you're in this field and you want to participate, please join us on these calls. But what will SDV do? What will the evolution look like for vehicle software? And this is what I'm gonna try to explain because a lot of different organizations are using the term SDV, but no one really knows what it means, and maybe I don't either, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> um, okay, so today we have many, many different processors in the car. We have separate processors for instrument cluster, uh, infotainment, heads-up display, and then we have literally, an average car has 60 to 100 ECU controllers. And literally, this is tens of millions of lines of code distributed across all these different computers. It's not easy to manage, it's not easy to upgrade, hence why the automotive industry is behind the mobile phone. The trend, as I mentioned, is very powerful multi-core SOCs. So what we're seeing is the consolidation of all these functions on a handful of processors. So instrument cluster, infotainment, heads-up display, easily can run on a single multi-core processor. But you need software to do it. That's what I'm gonna get to. ADAS, cameras, sensors, all of that stuff that, you know, uh, uh, driver assistance can also, also be consolidated on a single processor. Um, controllers for other things like temperature, lighting, etc., can all be consolidated. But the problem is that today, the software is really tightly coupled with the hardware. It's an embedded device. It's a single monolithic software image. And if you need to make a single change, for example, a single security fix, a safety fix, something, you need to recompile the whole image and re-download it to the car. And normally, it's not even over the air. I mean, over the air upgrades are starting to happen by some manufacturers, but typically requires a technician at the dealership to do it. With SDV, we're completely decoupling the hardware from the software. We fully support uh, different hypervisors, some open source and also closed source proprietary ones. We don't care, it's up to the industry to decide. We support Vert IO for device and hardware uh, virtualization, uh, device uh, uh, support for virtual devices and a complete decoupling of the hardware and software. Also today, as I mentioned, when you want to fix a single piece or line of code, you have to upgrade the entire image. With SDV, our goal is that you'll be able, using containers and containerizing certain functions and certain, certain applications, you'll be able to upgrade individual components. And that really is a key part of the vision of delivering this software-defined vehicle. Today, each car, let's say by a given manufacturer, from different model years, has different software. Why? Because they have different hardware. And because of that tight coupling, uh, each car has a different version of the software. Yeah, there's a lot of code that's shared, but it's still a different version, and it's a pain in the butt to manage. <laughs> and with SDV, the idea is to, across different model years, 
inside like a single car manufacturer, use the same software base completely. It doesn't matter. It, like it's analogous to, um, it, it's basically treating the car like a server is one way to put it. But it's also analogous to Apple iOS, where you know iOS runs on four, five, six generations of phones. It should be the same for automotive. It's not today. I know it sounds such a simple thing to do, but it's not today. It's not that way, and we need to make it that way. And things like decoupling the hardware and the software will make this possible. So some of the use cases for SDV. Well, the first one, an obvious one, is run AGL instrument cluster side by side with AGL infotainment. Second use case, let's say your car company has decided to choose Android for infotainment, no problem. You can use AGL for instrument cluster side by side on the same processor. Another use case, you can run AGL instrument cluster, infotainment, and then you can run all of the driver assistance, ADAS, you can run even a separate RTOS to run that stuff in a critical, safety critical environment. The thing is, none of this is science fiction. We have been demonstrating this at events for real for years at AGL. It's still not deployed in vehicles because you know the automotive industry needs to catch up. But you can come to our showcase and see these demos at any of our events because we've been showing this already for many years. And another use case is cloud native AGL. So people say, oh, it's just everybody's jumping onto the cloud, but it's actually very useful. <laughs> uh, we're expanding uh, AGL development community options by having uh, AGL supported on AWS Graviton. And this is a cloud based ARM64 uh, environment. And again, because of Vert.io, we're able to have the exact same software image uh, run in the cloud. And so you can have a developer working at Starbucks on a laptop and doing you know, coding, debugging, testing remotely. And so you don't need physical hardware anymore. So this is quite useful, and we're supporting that at AGL. So to summarize, AGL SDV, SDV is really about modernizing in-vehicle software, consolidating multiple functions like instrument cluster, infotainment, et cetera, on a single SOC, Simplifying the software lifecycle, the deployment, the management, the over-the-air updates, simplifying all of that, making individual components upgradable, and having a single software platform across different vehicle types and different model years. So this is my attempt to explain SDV to you. <laughs> OK, another very important. Uh, development at AGL. So Flutter is an app and UI development toolkit. It's open source, was originally developed by Google, and Toyota decided to take Flutter and make an embedded automotive version of it, and then contributed all their code back to AGL. So we're really thankful to Toyota for doing this. We're now the home of automotive Flutter. And we believe strongly that Flutter will be the future for and the de facto standard for UI for automotive. And the reason why this is cool also is that we know that two large German car manufacturers that I can't mention are also using Flutter. And so when they become public, it will become the de facto standard because you'll have the largest companies in the world supporting Flutter. Uh, so really exciting because we're the home of that code and we just, we're just we really pushing for it and we want, we want this to happen. And so recently, uh, we completely redid our AGL user interface. This is actually the actual user interface. This is our home screen. Uh, I hope the colors come out, but it's really cool. You can come see it at the showcase. Uh, we want to thank uh, ICS, uh, literally from the day we decided to start this project to today was six weeks completely redid the UI using Flutter in six weeks. And so we're really thankful to ICS for helping us design this new UI. This is the HVAC system, and this is the media playback, but it's better to come see it in person. Okay, so I'm running out of time, so quickly, uh, we're gonna be at CES where you can see more demos. Um, this is what our booth looks like in previous years. Uh, this year we're going to have uh, a vehicle, 
The 2024 Lexus TX500 will be in the booth showing uh, uh, AGL-based system. So we're really thankful to Toyota for providing this vehicle. And we will be right next to Mercedes, Volkswagen, Hyundai in the automotive technology area. So we hope that you can come and see us there. Uh, another note, we're going to have our AGL all-member meeting winter in February here in uh, Tokyo at the Hilton Shinjuku. So please join us for that as well. The CFP is now open and will be closing on January 21st. And then one final note, uh, the AMM summer has also been decided. We will be in Berlin uh, at the Doubletree Berlin, great brand new hotel, July 17th to the 19th. And stay tuned for CFP information. The website is already live and you can go check it out. So with that, I just want to remind everyone that AGL is strongly a code first organization. Uh, we've been saying this since day one and the reason for that is we're concerned that if you're a specification organization, you can have multiple vendors claim to be compliant to the spec, but then you end, back, you end up back to my first slide, which is more fragmentation because each uh, version of AGL would be different. And so AGL is code first. The starting point for AGL projects is you go to the AGL website, you download the code, that's your starting point. That ensures that people at least are using a very uh, common uh, software base. So thank you very much for your uh, time.